I, I know you already clapped for Peter Brown, but uh, he's the uh, pianist and choir director here at St. Andrews, and you could clap one more time for him. <laughs> uh, if you have a cell phone, make sure it's off. If you need the washroom the next little while, out the back door, or that door in the corner and downstairs and follow the signs, you'll find it. Um, this is a, a community event, not a St. Andrews event. The, I'm a member of the organizing committee that has been running a speaker series in the community for a few years. Of course, like everything else, it got shut down for the last two years, so you haven't heard anything. So this is our first attempt at uh, coming back uh, after COVID. Um, I wanted to introduce uh, any of the committee members that are here tonight. There are some from each of the three churches plus the Civitan. Uh, like everybody else, they're busy people, so they're not all here tonight. Uh, and the reason I want to introduce them to you is so that if you have a topic you would like to see explored, or you know of a speaker who's really good and, and, and would be of interest to the community, you would speak to one of these committee members and give them that information. So I believe the only two committee members who are here tonight are Joan, wave your hand, Joan, Joan Gillen, and myself. So um, if you, uh, uh, but I, I will name the others. You, most of you know Bonnie McFarland. She represents uh, St. Peter's up the hill. And uh, Doris Rankin represents the Civitan Club uh, on this committee. And although Rhonda Tees no longer sits on the committee, she does all our advertising. So you wave your hand, please, too, Rhonda. Thank you. The next uh, program in this uh, speaker series will be, uh, will be taking place on November the 16th here. Uh, at 7.30 in the evening. I think that's a Wednesday again. Um, and the presenter will be a young man by the name of Robert Gardner, who I believe lives in the Cedar Hill community. His, uh, and he is writing a book on the history of Pakenham. So again, you'll see the advertising and forward start to show up very shortly. Uh, but uh, so uh, follow the advertising and hopefully uh, some of you at least will join us. Um, I, I think that's all other than to invite David Sale, who lives in the Pakenham community, to come forward and introduce Peter Sale. Uh, can I have my paper back, please, Dave? <laughs> <laughs> I do, but just in case. Oh, that guy, I'll tell you. Um, yeah, I don't know where to start with Peter. I've known him for 78 years. That's probably longer than anyone else here. And so I've got a whole evening's worth of tales I could tell, which I'm not going to. Um, but what I will tell you is that Peter has always been fascinated with nature. When we lived in Bermuda, he used to go down to the ocean and scramble around the rocks and look in the tide pools to see what was there. Or he'd be laying on his stomach, on his elbows, with a twitch of grass, trying to lure a land crab out of its hole. Uh, when we came to Canada, we'd go to cottages. we up on Lake Kuchiching or Lake Nipissing. We're on the beach getting a suntan. He's back in the woods, seeing what he can find and bring home. Uh, by the time he was in high school, there was a whole room in our house dedicated to his zoo and uh, it seemed to keep growing. Fortunately for the animals and for Mum's sanity, his university professors convinced him that he should get involved in this emerging new science of ecology, where you study the animals in their natural setting. You don't bring them home. So, well, if you're gonna, nat you're gonna study creatures in their natural setting, you need to choose where you're going to work. Do you want to work in a black fly infested bog in Northern Ontario? Or would you rather work on a coral reef on a tropical island somewhere? And uh, Peter made the latter choice. So he went to the University of Hawaii, got a doctorate in marine biology there, and then started on an extensive teaching career, first in Australia at the University of Sydney, 
uh, for 20 years where he did research on the Great Barrier Reef. And then he spent another 20 years teaching in North America in the uh, University of New Hampshire and then at the Windsor University uh, while he continued to do research in the Caribbean. Now, I want you to imagine that you are a grad student at the University of Windsor. Winter is coming on. It's going to be cold. It's going to be sleet and snow and ice and freezing cold temperatures. If you are a grad student under Dr. Sale, there's a very good chance that at some point you're going to be boarding a plane and flying to Belize and going diving on the reef there. Needless to say, Peter was a very popular teacher. After retiring in 2006, he didn't stop his work. He became assistant director for coastal projects, the United Nations University Institute for Water, Environment, and Health. And I've got to read a quote here because I'll mess this up if I do it from memory. He has successfully used his fundamental science research to develop and guide projects in international development and sustainable coastal marine management in the Caribbean and the Indo-Pacific. Um, you may know the Palm Project that was started in Dubai where this huge palm-shaped subdivision was built out into the Mediterranean. The idea being that there would be condos and there would be lagoons and an artificial reef and it would be just wonderful. And this um, construction was large enough to be seen from space. The problem was the people who designed it knew nothing about the ecology. And by the time Peter and his team were called in, there was a looming disaster. And although they worked with these people for quite some time to try and straighten out the mess, they in the end didn't want to listen to the science. And uh, so it was a frustrating business for him. But they still had a hand in trying to correct one of the world's greatest ecological disasters. He's written many scientific papers. He was a book editor and a contributor. And recently he has written two books. The first one is Our Dying Planet, which is his one passion about what we're doing to this planet and what we've got to do to make a change so it will be here for our grandchildren. And the second book is the one he's going to talk about tonight, Coral Reefs, Majestic Realms Under the Sea, about his passion for the coral reefs and why they are important. He has a fascinating blog uh, where he talks about science topics. And he's regularly, as you can imagine, asked to speak at various groups, community groups, conferences, you name it. And he travels a great deal to do that. In fact, I just get tired keeping up with his schedule. Um, but I think we're very fortunate to have Peter with us tonight. And uh, I'm sure you're going to have a, a wonderful evening listening to what he has to say. Peter? Thank you, David. You should never have your younger brother introduce you. <laughs> it's the first rule. Um, this seems to have gone to sleep. Uh, how do I wake it up again? <laughs> yeah, he didn't tell me it would go to sleep if I put it down. Okay. Well, let me, I mean, it was working when I put it down there, and it's just been sitting, so it should work. I hope you all don't have somewhere important to be at the end of this. We may be delayed. There it is. Thank you. Okay. Um, yes, I am going to talk about coral reefs. And when Dave invited me to do this, I said, I can't imagine there's anybody in Pakenham who'd want to hear about coral reefs. But um, he assured me there were. So we'll do what we can. 
Uh, and uh, yes, I'm going to start in 1998. Uh, because 1998 was when I woke up. Uh, 1998 was the first time that coral reefs around the world bleached. Um, they had bleached before in different places, but this was an around the world phenomenon. It was a particularly warm year. It was the biggest El Nino we'd ever had. Uh, it's still the second biggest we've ever had. and. Coral reefs bleached as summer came on in different places around the world. Now, bleaching doesn't automatically kill corals. It can kill them. Um, and uh, it is a stress response. And if the stressful conditions last for a couple of weeks, a lot of the corals die. And there are large reefs in the Indian Ocean even today which have never recovered from that 1998 phenomenon. I thought it would be a wake-up call to the world. It was a wake-up call to me. Um, but the world went on. And 20 years later, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change wrote this about coral reefs in a document where they were pointing out that 1.5 degrees was a lot better than 2 degrees warming. When scientists use phrases like more than 99% dead, they're really talking as in plain English, they're saying coral reefs are likely toast. That's something that is worth thinking about. Most of us have received that message, and we think of it as an unfortunate environmental phenomenon, and then we get on with our lives. In March of this year, the Great Barrier Reef bleached. It was the sixth time it had reached. It had bleached since 26, sorry, the fourth time since 2016. The sixth time it had ever bleached. We are in a different world to the world we used to be in. And this was a, a, a La Nina year, which means lower than average temperatures. The world has warmed up enough now that you can have serious bleaching in less than hot temperatures. 91% of the reefs were affected, some of them severely. Coral reefs around the world have now lost 50% of the coral cover they had in the 1970s not completely due to bleaching. We do other things to coral reefs to damage them. They've lost 50%, which is basically like saying to you, we've lost half the trees on the planet. Now think about that. I wondered for a long time why people didn't see this as a wake-up call to get busy and do something about the environmental crisis. And it dawned on me one day that uh, most of us have never seen a coral reef. We may think we know about them because there are images, images of them all around us, and the images are, are spectacular. And we see these images, and we think we know what coral reefs are, and then we hear they're dying, and we say, oh, well. But we don't know them. We know of them. You can go onto Netflix and watch videos about coral reefs. This is quite a good one. You can buy art for your walls on reef themes. You can get books for your children about coral reefs. And you can decorate your bathroom so it looks like a coral reef. And yet, we don't know them. And so what we're going to do tonight is try and tell you a few things about coral reefs that I think most of you don't already know. And maybe that will help you to know them more. And that might even suggest they're worth caring about. And I'm going to do this by telling a series of stories, some of them complicated, some of them simple. The first one involves this cute little guy. His name. Corythoichthys intestinalis. It's longer than he is. This little fish is four, four inches long. Most people snorkeling over a coral reef would not even notice it. 
But a scientist named Anne Grinnell noticed it, and she noticed that the color patterns on their heads were variable enough that she could recognize individuals, which meant she could go back to places time after time, find the same fish, and find out what they were doing. And so she did a study to find out how these animals spend their lives, and specifically how they breed. This is a pair of these fish. They're a pipefish. They're related to uh, seahorses, but they don't curl up like a silly little horse. They look like a pipefish, a decent fish. The male is the one in the background. It's fatter than the female because, like the seahorses, it's the males that carry the eggs. They take care of the eggs until they hatch. They have a pouch, and that male has eggs in his pouch, so he's looking a little fat compared to the sleek female. These are some of the things that Anne found by watching these fish. She found that they live a solitary life. You don't usually see pairs of them together. They live a solitary life. They spend their day wandering around in a particular location. In the case of the males, it's about 10 meters squared. In the case of the females, about 35 meters squared. They occasionally see each other, and they just wander on their way, doing their feeding and hunting and keeping out of trouble. The breeding season lasts from September to March, and during that time, the male is usually carrying eggs. When they court, it happens at sunrise. And just that fact tells you something about the dedication of that scientist, getting up every morning, climbing into a damp wetsuit, getting into a boat, getting out to the reef, getting in the water before the sun came up so that she could find what the fish were doing when they started their day. And what they did when they started their day was that the female would visit a male, and if courtship happened, it would start then. Courtship takes about an hour. There's lots of complicated maneuvering. They end up twirling around each other, rising above the bottom. And at the critical moment, the female sheds her clutch of eggs. They're sticky. They stick together. They're maneuvered into the male's pouch. And in that process, the male fertilizes them. The male then carries them for 10 to 12 days until they hatch. The female, having shed her eggs, says, to hell with this. i finished. We're done and she leaves. And she does nothing to do with rearing of the, of the eggs. The male does the whole thing until the eggs hatch. And when they hatch, they hatch into tiny little larvae which float off on the tide. The most amazing thing that Anne discovered was that these animals are faithful monogamists. Each female breeds with one male. There are other males in the area. She passes them every day, but she does not breed with them. She visits her male every morning at sunrise, and Anne called it a daily greeting ceremony, and they nod their heads at each other, and then they go about their day, sort of, hi, how are you, just checking in. On the day that the male has shed his eggs, or perhaps the day after, that's when courtship happens and he gets another clutch. This is not an important story, but I tell it to you because it reveals something about these animals that most people would never suspect. Most people think the fishes on coral reefs are swimming around for people to see, and that's the story. The story is much more complicated than that, and this is just one example of many, many stories we could tell. Here's an even simpler story. Those of you who remember your high school biology, when you see an animal with jointed legs, count the legs. Three pairs, it's an insect. Four pairs, it's a spider. Five pairs, it's a crab or a lobster or a shrimp. 100 pairs, it's a centipede. This is a crab. I call the story Rapunzel, and you'll see why in a minute. This is a very special crab. 
It's also a very tiny crab. Its name is also bigger than it is, Hapilocarcinus marsupialis. Its common name is the coral gall crab, which I think sounds disgusting. It's a, a little animal. The females are five millimeters across from here to here. Uh, this is the head end down here. These are the two eyes. The mouth is just under here. This is the top of its shell. Why it doesn't look like a typical crab is it's got its abdomen exposed because it's carrying a huge bundle of eggs and it's using its abdomen to hold them against its belly. You know, crabs are very discreet, polite little animals. They're not like Lobsters and shrimp. Lobsters and shrimp have their whole abdomen trailing out for everyone to see. Crabs carried all neatly tucked up underneath. Most people don't even know they have an abdomen, but this one's got its abdomen out with that huge clutch of eggs. The males are only a millimeter wide. They're even tinier. And these animals have a very close relationship with very finely branched, rather beautiful corals of the genus Poslopora or Stylophora. Now those eggs, when they hatch, are going to hatch into little larvae and float out into the ocean. When those larvae come back from the ocean, and we'll get to that in a minute, the female does a very peculiar thing. She lands on top of a branch of Apostle Opera, and she sits there, which is a supremely stupid thing to do because if something that likes to eat little crabs comes by, she's sitting up there right up exposed where she can be eaten. But she sits there and she holds on, and the coral does something strange. It modifies its growth, and instead of continuing to grow up, it grows around her and eventually builds first a cup and then a gall with her inside. The males can still get in and out through crevices in the walls. And being a crab, she only has to get fertilized once in her entire life because they can keep sperm for years. And they only live about three or four years. This is specialization of an extreme degree. And obviously, if she had long hair, the males would have been able to get her out of the gall, right? How on earth do such specializations evolve? You can say, oh, it's evolution. You can say, oh, it's instinctive behavior. Those are words that describe it. They don't explain it. I have no idea how this ever came to be. And this is only one example of myriad of examples of very close associations between species on reefs where they interact in some way that's exceedingly complicated. This is a close-up photo of the actual branch of um, Postal Opera in this case. The branch is coming towards you out of the screen. This is the tip of the branch, and it's obviously deformed. And that cavity in there is there. That little female crab is trapped for the rest of her life. Trapped, but very, very safe. And she feeds on coral mucus and zooplankton. I want to change tack and talk about something rather different. Reefs as fantastic places. I should have said at the beginning that coral reefs contain nothing that isn't made by creatures that live there. There's no rock on a reef that isn't part of the reef. I'm sorry, that isn't produced by the animals that make the reef. These tiny creatures are building enormous structures. And these structures are architecturally beautiful. This photograph is looking down slope. So this is shallow water at the bottom and deep water at the top. It's probably two meters across at the bottom of that photograph, maybe four or five at the top. Look at that set of terraces. 
It's almost like a hillside in Southeast Asia, except that's nothing to do with farming, but it is to do with putting the coral in the best possible position to capture as much light as possible, because they need light. But I'm not so much concerned about the fact that it's done so that they can get lots of light. I'm concerned about the fact that it's beautiful to look at. It's soothing to the eye. And I marvel at the fact that nature so often produces things that are beautiful to our eye. This is a boulder coral close up. Each of these little hillocks is about half a centimeter across. Each of them is the, is the, uh, each, each of these hillocks is the uh, skeleton of a single coral polyp. It's daytime, so the polyps are retracted. You can't really see them. There's a thin veneer of tissue over the surface, so this would be quite slippery to touch. But what you're seeing is the skeleton underneath. And look at it, it's not perfectly regular, but it's almost perfectly regular. It's like a honeycomb in a beehive. It's beautiful. Here is a branching coral. And again, look at the regularity, but not perfect symmetry of those little cups all the way up the sides of those branches. Each of those cups is where a single polyp lives and there's one right on the tip of the branch. When you put all these different shapes together and step back, you see a world which is very complicated topography. Lots of spaces and lots of shapes, lots of different possibilities for other creatures to live. There are little fish and shrimps that live their lives wandering around in this maze created by this boulder coral. They'll occasionally hop over the wall and go and explore a little further. They're very safe down in those little crevices. There are other fish, of course, too big to get into those crevices. They're just treated as a boulder. There are fish that live on the branches of this coral. and You don't find them living anywhere else. And there are bigger fish that live in the shelter underneath the coral. The same is true for crabs and lobsters and other mobile creatures. The reef is a complicated architectural space that provides lots and lots of opportunities for different kinds of creatures. And it's all produced by polyps building their skeletons. If you'd go to an even wider scale, you start seeing even different patterns. This one is Aitutaki. Aitutaki is in the South Pacific. It's sitting in 4,000 meters of water. That lagoon is 12 kilometers in diameter. This is what we call a almost atoll because it has one island here which is the remnant of a volcano. In another thousand years or so, that will have eroded away and we'll have a true atoll. Think what it would have been like to be sailing a ship in the 1500s without very good maps, and you're sailing along in the middle of the ocean and there's 4,000 meters of water beneath your keel and all of a sudden you're on dry land. Reefs can be scary. This particular reef has got um, some quite nice resorts down here and on here. If you've got lots of money, um, you can have a great vacation there. I've never been there. I can't afford it. Uh, but it is a, a wonderful place. And this lagoon is protected water, maybe 40 meters deep, 4,000 meters on the outside. Here's the northeast coast of Australia, coast of Queensland. The Tropic of Capricorn is right about here, and that's where the Great Barrier Reef starts. All of these little things are parts of the Great Barrier Reef, and it extends up to about here. 2,800 kilometers long, 
up to 300 kilometers wide in this part. Most of these reefs are sitting in 40 to 50 meters of water. The reefs on the outer edge will be 40 to 50 meters deep on the inside, 1,000 meters or more on the outside. All of that built by tiny little creatures. And it seems like it can go on forever. This is the open ocean. The coast of Australia is over here. Look at those reefs. All of that is built by living creatures. All of it. Even the sand is built by living creatures. This is a famous place. It gets photographed a lot. It's between two reefs on the Great Barrier Reef, Hook Reef and Hardy Reef, and I forget which is which. But they're side by side, and they have this wonderful channel between them that looks man-made. It's not man-made. It's made by coral and the velocity of the tidal flow back and forth through that channel. I took you back to the map to talk again about the Capri Tropic of Capricorn. There's a group of reefs down here called the Capricorn Reefs. There are about seven or eight reefs in the group. These are the four in the middle. And this is a satellite image, um, but we're going to go to an aerial photograph. So we're looking at the one on the extreme right in the previous photograph. That's One Tree Reef. And then behind it, Sykes, Heron, Wistari. Many people who go to Australia as tourists will visit the Heron Island Resort. Um, it is just as good in terms of what you can see as going up to uh, Cairns. It's a different experience to Cairns. You're right out on the reef and you're living on the reef. There's One Tree Island here, there's Heron Island here, there's no islands on Sykes or Wistari. There are reefs in the background, some of which have got islands on them, some of them don't. And I've come to these reefs because I want to talk about them in some depth. These are basically flat-topped hills sitting on the continental slope shelf in 40 meters of water. And there's a widespread belief that coral reefs are extremely ancient and they grow very slowly and they're millions of years old. We know quite a bit about the geological history of One Tree Reef, and so we're going to talk about it. One Tree Reef I know very well because uh, it has a very tiny research facility on it, which I used to manage, uh, and is still going strong. Um, my last visit to One Tree Reef was a half-hour visit. We came over from Heron Island in a helicopter. Uh, there you can see the set of small buildings on the island. All, incidentally, this is all submerged at high tide. This is a low-tide photograph. Um, we landed on one of those rubble banks. That's why we went at low tide. Uh, landing on the rubble bank, you stay away from the birds which are nesting on the island. And the people on the island were kind enough to come over in a boat so we didn't have to swim across. And we had a half hour and then we went back. And I'm not here to talk about my reminiscences of One Tree Island. I'm here to talk about its history. A flat-topped hill covered with coral on a coastal plain that's 40 meters deep. If you're going to understand the history of that reef and how it got built, you need to understand sea level change. Because when sea level falls, coral reefs exposed to the air are killed. When sea level rises too quickly, coral can be drowned, because coral can't live in deep water. And there's a limit to how quickly it can grow up. Secondly, you need to know about the glacial interglacial cycles. During the two million years of the Pleistocene, we had a number, about 20 cycles of glaciation, when the ice built up and came down over North America and then retreated again. Every time that ice built up 
over North America and Europe, it took water that would otherwise have been in the ocean. And so sea level went down when the ice was at its maximum, and it went up when the ice was at its minimum. The fluctuations are about 120 meters, which means that the Queensland Shelf spent a lot of the Pleistocene high and dry. Obviously, the Great Barrier Reef is less than two million years old because there's been lots of periods during that two million years when it was high and dry and it would have all been killed. Two million years ago, the other thing you need to know is Australia has been moving closer and closer to Southeast Asia for the last several million years. And two million years ago, it was too far south for one tree reef to have coral growing on it. So that makes it an even younger reef. Between two million years ago and 20,000 years ago, there were multiple cycles. And once it got far enough north, during those high water play periods, there could have been an opportunity for corals to colonize those hills and grow, and they did. There were one tree reefs in the past. 20,000 years ago was the last glacial maximum, uh, last, sorry, the last glacial minimum, <laughs> um, and no, no, the last glacial maximum, that's right, I'm getting confused. Everything is dry land again. One Tree Reef is less than 20,000 years ago, 20,000 years old. This is a detailed map of average sea level for the world for the last 24,000 years. So here's, here's the present at the right, 24,000 years ago. Here's the last glacial maximum about 21,000 years ago, and you'll see it's 120 meters below the present. Once the ice began to retreat, sea level began to rise. There were some sudden rises because there were things like Lake Agassiz, which is a very big lake in North America. It couldn't get to the ocean because of all the ice. When the ice freed up the St. Lawrence Seaway, it rushed out, and the world's sea level went up suddenly. Sea level can change suddenly, and it might in the future if some of those glaciers in uh, Antarctica let loose. But you'll notice that if you look at the pattern of sea level, it doesn't reach 40 meters below the level of today until 10,000 years ago. One Tree Reef can't be more than 10,000 years old because this was all dry land. 10,000 years ago, the ocean surrounded the foots, the feet of those hills. 8,000 years ago, it was halfway up the side and coral could start to grow. And about 7,000 years ago, sea level reached present day levels. And you don't see the upward rise that's happening now because we're busy raising sea level. The corals themselves didn't get to the surface because they couldn't grow upward as quickly as the, as the sea level was rising. So if you're thinking about this, 20,000 years ago, there's no reef at One Tree Reef. It's just a flat hill, flat-topped hill. 10,000 years ago, the sea level is at the base. 8,000, it's halfway up. 7,000 sea level is about where it is now, and the coral is growing upward towards the sea surface. 6,000 years ago, the corals reached the sea surface, and it's starting to have things happen that fill in that lagoon. It's about 4,000 years ago that that hill would now look like One Tree Reef today. So, one Tree Reef is not millions of years old. It's actually very young. And One Tree Reef is typical of coral reefs around the world. They've all been interrupted in this way. They've all had these, these strange histories where there were multiple attempts. None of the existing reefs go back millions of years. 
might point out that 10,000 years ago, there were hunter-gatherers in Queensland that undoubtedly hunted and gathered over that coastal plain. They probably climbed those hills to see what they could find. 8,000 years ago, in other parts of the world, we were starting agriculture. 4,000 years ago, we built the pyramids in Egypt. One tree was built over 4,000 years between 8,000 and 4,000 years ago. That's how old it is. 4,000 years to build it, and it's 4,000 years old. It's no older than the Great Pyramid. These amazingly large structures, structures that are strong enough not only to support a helicopter, but to support a 747. And there were, there were runways all over the Pacific on coral reefs. Huge structures built by tiny creatures in, relatively speaking, short periods of time. OK, enough about how they get built. I've been talking about larvae and larvae going out to sea. And I want to talk a little bit more about larvae for a number of reasons. One of the interesting things about reef organisms, whether they're the corals or the fish or the snails or anything else, the vast majority of them have larvae which are pelagic. They float in the ocean. Now, you'd think given that reefs are relatively rare, that if you're living on a reef, it might be good to keep your kids at home so they have a place to grow up. No, they send them all out into the open ocean. There are possible reasons why they do that. We have no idea which reason is the real one. And we know relatively little about their larval lives, although in recent years we've learned a lot. And for instance, with the corals, one of the things we know is this. Now, these little bundles that you see rising here are bundles of eggs and sperm being released by the coral polyps as they breed. Those little bundles will reach the surface and they'll break open, and then the sperm are free to mate, uh, to fertilize the eggs from other bundles. They can't self-fertilize. Now, it's interesting that that's the way they breed, but the more interesting thing is all the corals on the Great Barrier Reef, all the different species of coral on the Great Barrier Reef do this on the same one or two nights of the year in November, a week after the spring tide. It's reliable enough that the dive industry sets up special night dives at extra high prices to go out and see the coral spawning. Only happens a couple of nights of the year. What's even more interesting is it happens a week after the spring tides in November on the Great Barrier Reef, but if you fly to Western Australia, it happens at a completely different time of year. They still all do it together, but at a different time of year. And if you go to the Caribbean, they do it together in August. Who made the decision when to do it? I have no idea. Now, the corals have larvae that are relatively simple. They have some stores from the egg, which they feed on as they grow. They're capable of a little bit of movement. And basically, they find a place to settle out, attach themselves, and hopefully grow into a coral. Some of the other creatures have much more complicated larvae. And we know a lot about the fish for a bunch of reasons. We know some things about the lobster. For instance, lobsters have some of the longest lived larvae. Lobster larvae will be a year and a half old before they come back to the reef. So they're not, it's not a little short phase in their life, even though we call it larval. I took this, I grabbed this photograph because it shows the bewildering array of biology that's going on here. This guy's got this flag it's carrying. I have no idea what it's for. This one's got these luminous lures trailing out behind it. Again, I don't know why. And this one here, its intestine is outside its body. And when it becomes a juvenile, it throws that bit of intestine away. Again, I don't know why. 
we have a lot to learn about the larval lives of reef fishes. These photographs are taken in the middle of the ocean in about 40 meters of water, no, 40 feet of water, in the dark, at night, in a moonless night. And you can get some amazing photographs. This is an eel larva. He's curled up with his head in the center. It doesn't look like an eel at all. It's completely flat, completely translucent. It looks like a sort of a translucent leaf. It's an eel. This guy has the most amazing pectoral fins, which when he wrecks them like that, it probably makes him very difficult to swallow. He doesn't swim with them out like that all the time. But that, I mean, that's, that's gorgeous. There's all sorts of things going on there that we don't know about. This one looks a lot more like what it looks like when it becomes a juvenile. This is a surgeon fish. It looks very much like a juvenile surgeon fish, except it's completely transparent. You can see right through it. And it's one of the largest of the larvae. Uh, most of the surgeon fishes are about two and a half centimeters long by the time they reach the end of their larval life. We know a lot about surgeon fish larvae because uh, a study done in the 1950s in Hawaii produced the first information about reproduction in surgeon fish. These are manini, a common surgeon fish in Hawaii. And the study showed that they spawn monthly, tied to the lunar cycle. They spawn at high tide. They spawn in midwater. They go to places on the outer reef edge in groups. They swim up into the water column. They shed their eggs and sperm. The tide carries them away from the reef. The eggs get fertilized, they hatch in two to three days, and then they go through a process of development which lasts 10 to 12 weeks before they're the size of that creature I showed you in the last slide. And at that point, they swim into reefs. Why they swim into reefs, how they swim into reefs has been a center of interest for some time uh, the last several years among reef ecologists. How well do they swim? Well, they swim very well. And I thought the way of demonstrating that was to compare a larval surgeon fish with Michael Phelps. Now, when Michael Phelps set his record for the 100-meter butterfly, he swam at 1.04 body lengths per second for 49.82 seconds, and that record has never been beaten yet. That is very fast. You can put a larval surgeon fish in a flume, and with a current of water, you can get it swimming at 5.4 body lengths per second, and it can do that for 194 hours before it gives up. And in the space of that time, it'll swim 94 kilometers. And it does all this without eating. And I suggest Michael has some catching up to do. <laughs> um, and if you don't like that comparison, well, you could say, well, Michael was doing burst speed. That was his maximum speed that he could manage. Put them in a flume at 24 body lengths per second. They can last 180 seconds. And in that 180 seconds, they can do 108 meters. So they're pretty good swimmers. And one of the surprising things as people started learning about larval fish on reefs was how good, sorry, how well they could swim. Because larvae of fish in places like the North Sea don't swim very well at all. This is one of the largest surgeon fish larvae, and the photograph just shows you the transparent nature. These guys, you never see them on the reef in the daytime. You never see them on the reef before they're ready to settle. They will come in at night like this. In the morning, they'll already be pigmented, growing scales, becoming juveniles. This one turns into a fish like that. We know a fair bit about what larval reef fish do when they come into a reef. Um, we're learning more and more. We still don't know everything by any stretch of the imagination. They can smell reefs, 
and swim towards them. They can hear them, swim towards them. They actively swim in at night, as I said. It's not, it's not that they accidentally find their way back to a reef. They reach a certain stage and they go to a reef. They choose very specific places to settle. They don't just settle out randomly over the reef. They're in very particular kinds of places, different for different species. We don't really understand how any of this is done, especially for fish like surgeon fishes, which start their lives as fertilized eggs drifting in the ocean. Suppose they're floating along in the ocean and they smell a reef. How do they know it's a reef? How do they know they should swim towards it? We can say it's instinct. We can say it's a wonderful example of how powerful evolution is, and that's all true. That doesn't explain it. This is marvelous. There's an anemone fish. You may know anemone fish by, ne uh, by the name of Nemo. If you remember the story of Nemo, he got lost and he had to find his way home. Believe it or not, larval anemone fishes sometimes find their way home. They don't do it all the time, but they do it much more frequently than you'd expect by chance. And I have absolutely no idea how they're able to get back to within a couple of meters of where they started their lives after 10 days floating in the ocean. Larval reef animals have millions of stories that are yet to be discovered, and they're all going to be fantastic. OK, enough about larvae. We'll go back to some other stories. Here's a very simple story. Here's a grouper and a moray eel swimming side by side. Now, why are they doing that? They're hunting together. They don't hunt together all the time. It only happens occasionally, but it happens more often than you'd expect by chance. And furthermore, you remember morays usually spend their day in a crevice with just their heads sticking out, sort of going while the divers swim by and gaze at them, horrified. They do most of their hunting at night. But the grouper comes along in the daytime, and by nodding his head in a particular way, and probably by some sounds, the grouper says, I'm hungry, let's go hunting. And the moray, if he's so inclined, joins. And they'll go hunting for an hour. Morays are very good at catching little fish in crevices. And groupers are very good at catching fish out in the open. Prey fish in the open frequently run into crevices. And prey fish in crevices frequently run to the outside. By hunting together, they catch more food than if they hunted alone. They don't share their food, but they share the effort of hunting. And during the hunt, the grouper signals to the moray, there's a fish under that shelf, there's a fish over there. Now you may think, OK, two fish, they hunt together, so what? Groupers and eels are very distantly related to each other. I've suggested they're no more closely related to each other than you are to a frog. They're probably no more closely related to each other than you are to a fish. When was the last time you tried to communicate with a frog? I can't even get my cats to stop scratching the furniture. <laughs> Here's another story that surpasses the imagination. And your role of the right vintage, you recognize this place, this amazing cantina. There was a band, it played, people listened. They gathered at the bar, people from all over the galaxy. They ate strange food, they played games, they talked to each other in strange languages. Sometimes fights broke out. It was a dynamic social scene but you don't have to go to a galaxy far, far away. All you have to do is go to a coral reef and look around 
and find a cleaning station. And a cleaning station isn't quite like a cantina, it's more like a hairdresser, but a very vibrant, active hairdressing saloon. Certain fish, the cleaners, set up these cleaning stations and the clients come in to be cleaned, to have ectoparasites removed from their body. It happens every day on every coral reef in the world. Different species of fish are cleaners. There are crabs and shrimp that are cleaners. And many, many species of fish are clients. This amazing photograph shows a cleaner about to enter the gill cavity of a large batfish. There's the batfish's eye and snout. His tail is back here, his dorsal fin's up here. He's got his gill cover raised so that the fish can get in. A fish's gills are one of the most delicate parts of its anatomy, and cleaner fish have teeth. And yet, he's inviting the cleaner to get in there and see if he can find any parasites. Here's a pair of cleaners cleaning another fish. It's got its mouth open, its gill cover raised. It's got all its fins spread so that the cleaners can get into every little crevice along the base of those fins and pick up parasites. Here's a group of manini waiting their turn to be serviced by this cleaner. There's a couple of them have already raised their gill covers, saying, you know, come and clean me. Come look at my gills. And here's a cleaner coming out of the mouth of a sweet lips. He probably went in through the gills. Eat fish the size of cleaners. And cleaners don't taste bad, and they're not toxic, and they do occasionally get eaten. And there's the problem. Because during the course of a day, a cleaner fish at a busy cleaning station can clean 2,000 fish of 150 species. And every time it does so, the cleaner risks being eaten. And the client risks being nipped in its mouth or its gills. And yet this happens 2,000 times a day. They'll clean divers too. I am queue up waiting to be cleaned, and while they're in the queue, they don't fight with each other or eat each other. They sit there patiently waiting their turn. The usual explanation, of course, is as well as the mutual benefit. The cleaner gets food, and the clients get their parasites removed. What a beautiful example of how wonderful nature is, and and you, you can just imagine the music and David Attenborough mouthing this all off, and, and it all sounds wonderful, but stop and think about it for a minute. I'm sure it is wonderful, and I'm sure it is an example of the incredible power of evolution, and I'm sure that mutual benefit is important, but how does it happen? Because every time they do it, they risk being eaten. And when you start looking at it in more detail, you discover some disturbing facts about the cleaners. They're not exactly altruistic all the time. They have favorites. How would you feel being lined up in a queue waiting to get into some uh, nightclub and somebody jumps the queue? You don't like it, right? Well, cleaners have favorites and they'll abandon a queue of patiently waiting clients to go over to their favorite, which could be a favorite species or a favorite individual. That's not the kind of behavior that encourages cooperation. And the cleaners cheat. It turns out that cleaners like to take an occasional mouthful of fish flesh. So how does this persist? given all these things. I think it's a beautiful example of the complexity and also an example of just how marvelous it is that it ever occurs. And as I say, you can see it on reefs anywhere, 
every day. The, the clients change their behavior waiting for the cleaners, and the cleaners are busy servicing the clients, and yet every now and then they're cheating. The cleaners will clean clients that are bigger than themselves. They'll clean clients that are about the same size they are. Take a look at that parrotfish. Look at, it, look at the posture. Look at the changed behavior as it waits to be cleaned. And I think the next one is a, yeah, this is a snapper. This is a fish that could easily eat a cleaner. He's got his mouth open saying, come inside. But it's not because he wants to eat him. He wants him to go in there and clean those gills. And unfortunately, I haven't got video of the uh, fish actually going inside. Barracuda. Barracuda have mouths full of teeth that are ideally shaped for catching small fish. And cleaners wander all over them. Look at those teeth. Here's a large grouper. The diver was impressed. You'll see in a minute. The, oh, yeah, OK, yeah, it's big, it's big. He's going in here because it's a cleaning station. And you'll have to watch quickly because it's short. Here comes the cleaner. He's cleaning his nostril for him. <laughs> you know, I mean, this is, this is amazing. Here's a, here's a manta ray, perhaps three meters across from wingtip to wingtip. He'll come into that cleaning station every day to be cleaned. And rays like sharps have multiple gill slits, not just one on each side. And there are the cleaners messing around those gill slits. Part of that individual's routine, and I said they'd clean divers. I've never done that. <laughs> and so the message from the cleaning station is, the main message from the cleaning station is this. If cleaning stations didn't exist, we would never imagine them. They are far and away the most complicated example of a multi-specific social interaction which occurs reliably day after day. There's nothing like them on the planet and you can find them on coral reefs anywhere you go. Not only are cleaning stations something that we would never imagine, if coral reefs didn't exist, we'd never imagine them either. And so the idea that these are wonderful places is worth thinking about. If they didn't exist, we would never imagine them. And why should we care? And at this point, of course, I could give you a whole bunch of statistics about why we should care. And I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to give you one fact. 25% of the organisms that live in the ocean live on coral reefs. And if we get rid of the coral reefs, as we appear to be doing, many, most, of that 25% is going to disappear too. And I happen to believe they all have just as much right as we do to live on this planet. So keeping them with us is an ethical thing to do. I particularly like this photograph because I think it symbolizes the ability to be one with nature that diver is clearly comfortable as part of that reef environment. And if we were more comfortable as part of our environment, maybe we would treat our environment
differently and to our benefit. I've got one more point to make. I said at the beginning, most people have never seen a reef. And I should have said most people have never seen a living reef because there are lots of fossil reefs. Reefs have been around for about four and a half, 450 million years. Not the same reefs, obviously, but reefs. Corals have been building reefs. Other creatures like sponges have been involved. Reefs have been built for 450 million years on this planet, and there are fossil reefs that you can visit. This is the Bruce Peninsula. The Bruce Peninsula is part of a fossil reef that extends from western New York up the Niagara Escarpment, Bruce Peninsula, west coast of Manitoulin Island, north coast of Lake Huron, west coast of Lake Michigan. An enormous arc of reef that grew around the edge of a northern branch of a tropical sea about 400 million years ago. They were built by corals and sponges and some other creatures, not the same species as build reefs today. I don't think any of the species on these reefs would have been still present today. They had fish, they had crabs, they had uh, mollusks, all the other kinds of creatures. They had creatures that no longer exist. I'm sure they would have been wonderful places to visit. In fact, if it was possible to time travel, I would love to go back and snorkel over one of them. If we do get rid of the coral reefs, there will be fossil reefs from the 20th century. There are fossil reefs that we can study to learn about what reefs used to be. I would like to think, however, that in a few decades' time, we wouldn't have to rely on fossil reefs, and that there would still be reefs on the planet, and that we could still visit them and learn about them. Because not only do they make our world wonderful, they make our lives wonderful. So thank you. I don't know if there's time for some questions, but uh, I can answer some, if there are some. Questions? Yeah. The, the most important thing that needs to be done is we have got to prevent the world's climate getting above one and a half degrees. Uh, I would like to see us nip it even sooner than that, but that's going to be very difficult. Uh, if we continue the way we're going, we're heading towards three and a half degrees, and you can guarantee there won't be any coral reefs that will survive that, because the corals can't stand those temperatures, and evolution is not something that can happen within decades. Evolution takes time. So the idea that they will somehow adapt, well, they won't. They will be dead. So, so that's the most important thing. But there's a whole bunch of other things we should be doing. We should be protecting them much more. We should be fishing them much less. We should be fishing them in ways that are less destructive. We certainly should be much more careful about how we develop coastlines near them so that we develop in ways that do not you know, cause siltation or pollution or any of those things. There's a, there's a whole bunch of things we do that damage coral reefs because they are pretty delicate systems. And, um, but if we, if we only do the simple things like preventing pollution, we're still going to watch them die because the ocean's going to get too warm. So, so it really comes back to climate change. And, and quite frankly, if we said we're going to look after the coral reefs, we'd be looking after ourselves as well, and we'd be looking after a whole bunch of other things as well. So it would be a good thing to do. But that's, that's the, the number one thing that is the problem. Yeah. yeah.
Yes. That, is, th that crackling is predominantly made by shrimps. There's various kinds of shrimps that, that do a lot of, um, they, they do it by flexing body parts that rub together. And so they're, it's sort of like stridulating like a, like a grasshopper does. Um, and they will make these sounds. And it's, it's communication. It's a social thing. And they make these noises. And yes, when you're in the water, you can hear it all the time. Uh, some of the fish make noises. I mean, that story about the grouper and the, and the moray eel, I'm quite sure, I haven't seen it reported yet, but I'm quite sure that the grouper is making sounds as well as nodding his head. Um, and some fish are more vocal than others. Uh, so there's, there's lots of sounds. And of course, there's also the natural or, or the non-biological sounds of the reef, simply the waves on the reef. Um, a reef produces a sound spectrum which, which can be recorded with, with the right kind of equipment uh, at some distance away. The interesting thing when it comes to fish being able to detect and swim towards is you're dealing with an animal that's only this long. And so, or though it can hear the sound, we still don't really understand how it's able to know what direction the sound's coming from because the animal is, you know, we've got ears which are this far apart and we can sort of triangulate. Um, but when, you're, when your sound receivers are very close together, how are you able to say, oh, that sound's coming from over there as opposed to over there? And they, they're able to do that. So there's, there's a lot we don't know about how they do it, but the, the soundscape is quite real. And in fact, there's been recent studies where they've recorded reef sounds and played them in the vicinity of artificial reefs and have had increased numbers of young fish assembling at the artificial reef, which is a, an interesting thing. I don't think it's a solution to taking care of our reefs, but it's an interesting sign that the sounds are important to them. And incidentally, uh, sounds in the ocean, we make all sorts of noises in the ocean and we never think about what it's doing to the creatures that live in the ocean that weren't used to those sounds in the first place. Um, and uh, I think we probably should be more attuned to the fact that we may be upsetting them. Sorry? No, I, I didn't catch that. My ears are terrible. Say that again. And and the after the aftermath of a hurricane is actually interesting. It, it first of all it depends a lot on the state of the tide and the direction the hurricane is traveling in. There can be hurricanes that will go over a reef and have hardly any impact at all. And there'll be other times where a hurricane of the same magnitude will leave the reef devastated with coral broken and turned over and all sorts of things. I don't know what the mobile creatures do during really severe windstorms because they clearly can't swim against it. Um, they can hunker down. Uh, I suspect they go deep and, and wait for it to die down and then come up again, but I don't know. The water stirs up all There's been some recent discussion on the web about um, silt being lifted up by hurricanes and, and then being deposited and causing problems. Yeah, yeah. So, and of course, the hurricanes are getting more intense. So. And you know why they're getting more intense. It's, it all comes back to us. It, it always comes back to us. It's kind of amazing. Yeah. Any others? Yeah. Is there such a thing as a fresh water uh, reef? Uh, corals don't live in fresh water. Um, the closest thing you get is in brackish water, you can get oyster reefs. You can, and oysters will build, they, I mean, I don't consider them reefs because, you know, they, they get this high and, and they're, they're just made up of oysters. But you can get that kind of development in brackish water, but not in fresh water. And, and so, yeah, the fresh water is a, 
is a, is a completely different world. Um, and one of my most disappointing experiences was my first dive in Lake Erie, because I, I got suited up and I rolled off the gunnel. And the first thing I did was I realized I was in fresh water, which isn't as buoyant, and I was weighted way too heavily, and I sank like a stone. <laughs> and I swam back to the surface and got rid of half the weight. And then I went down and looked around, expecting to see little creatures. That was nothing. Yeah, it was just, just sand and a little bit of stuff over here. And, and I realized I've been spoiled all my life diving on reefs. It's a, it's a really amazing experience. And you can really see just, well, first of all, if you know what you're looking for, you can see just about every phylum of animal on the planet on a coral reef. You've, you've got to be really lucky to find them all on one day. But there are even insects that live under the water on, in reef lagoons. You know, one or two flies, apparently. I've never seen them. Um, but a huge array of different kinds of creatures that, that live there. It is, it is mind-bogglingly, um, uh, for a biologist, is absolutely wonderful. Yeah, yeah. I'm talking too much. You've been trying to get a question in. What would you like to see happen to educate more people so they understand what they're looking for? Because there's a lot of I would, I would like to see us go back to the 1950s and try again. Because I think we've gone off on a really bad path. Um, and I didn't realize we were on that path. It seemed good to me. Everybody was getting richer and the world was getting better and fewer and fewer people were in poverty and we were making more and more food and all of these things happened at the expense of the planet. Um, and the fact is that the planet isn't built for eight billion people living a even a moderate standard of living. Never mind a North American standard of living. They're not, it's not built for eight billion people living a Mexican standard of living. It might be able to hold about three billion at a Mexican standard of living. Um, we've got this naive belief that no matter how many people there are, we can raise them all out of poverty and give them a quality of life second to none. We really need to reflect on that photograph that was taken in uh, 1968 when Anders looked out from the Apollo spacecraft and photographed the world in the sky of the moon. It's one of the most pho famous photographs, one of the most multiply reproduced photographs in the world. And it was the first time we had a photograph of our planet that said very clearly that it is one planet and that it is different to everything around it. And it's the only one that we know of that has life on it, certainly intelligent life. And I use the word intelligent loosely. Um, we need to look at that photograph and reflect because we have beliefs as humans that aren't compatible with living on a finite planet. And, and unless we change in ways that make it possible to live on that finite planet, we're slowly destroying it. And the, the reefs are simply the first to show the biggest damage because they're so delicate. So, you know, I know we can't go back to 1950. Um, what I would love to see is serious action by countries to really get us off fossil fuel. So that a country like Canada could say, we have a lot of fossil fuel buried in our country, and the moral thing to do, the ethical thing to do, is make sure it stays there. Now, we haven't, we haven't got to that yet. Uh, and, and then when we get rid of the energy side of it, we need to be thinking about food and how much of the land surface should be devoted to humans 
as opposed to the rest of the planet, which basically supports us. Uh, we've just been chewing it up, and we now have about 75% of the land surface taken over by agriculture and cities and industry. Um, and it's the 75%, which is the best part of the land, because we didn't focus on the really nasty parts. Uh, we need to seriously think about how we fit into the planet and get away from the idea that the planet is a big, um, a big department store that we can go to and help ourselves for things on the shelves and start recognizing the planet as something that we are a part of and that we have to take care of it. And, and that, is a, that is a change which is very, very profound and it is contrary to basic economic principles. It's contrary to lots and lots of, um, of uh, uh, people with interests in the status quo. You know, I've got stocks in oil wells. I don't want to see those oil wells not producing oil, you know. Um, we need fewer Elon Musks and more people who use their resources in ways that are productive and creative for the best of for the planet. And uh, I keep waiting for the transition to come because I think we're smart enough to recognize what we're doing, but it's taken a lot longer than I thought it would. Yeah. Like I say, in 1998, I thought we finally had the signal that was going to wake us all up. And now it's 2022, and we're not woken up yet. We're, we're much better at saying, oh, yes, we have to do something about climate change, but we haven't yet reduced the rate at which we're putting CO2 into the atmosphere. It's going up and up and up every year. And the more it goes up, the warmer the planet gets, and all the other problems spin on from that. So it's huge. But that's a terrible way to end up. <laughs> end up thinking about these reefs as fascinating, fantastic places, the kind of places that we are privileged to share the planet with. That's what I'd like you to take away for, from today. Thanks. Thank you. Well, I, I have the job of uh, thanking Peter, and uh, perhaps you can understand that at this moment I feel rather inadequate in trying to thank this man uh, suitably. Uh, this has been a fantastic presentation that uh, Peter has done for us. Uh, it did strike me, Peter, that uh, if you were trying to get us to understand uh, more about the complexity and the beauty of the natural world around all of us, mm. uh, you were successful. Mm, thank you. And for those of us that uh, farm a little, and, and probably all of you do, because if you don't own a farm, you at least have a garden, our agronomists are constantly reminding us in the last few years to understand the life that is going on mm -hmm. actively in that top six inches of topsoil mm -hmm. in which we grow mm -hmm. all our crops. It's phenomenal what's there. Mm -hmm. We just can't get down with the scuba, uh, scuba diving outfit <laughs> and take pictures of it easily, but it's a similar message yeah. to the one yeah. that you're giving us. Yeah. I'm sure Peter will meet you down below and, and uh, answer a few questions. Yeah. Now, in, in part of th uh, thanking Peter, <clears throat> um, the committee of which I'm a member, uh, we're, we're just a group of volunteers and we have no funding, so we have no money. So I'd say two things. First of all, uh, and we don't charge for these uh, uh, events, there is a collection plate at the door on the way out, and if you have a loony or a toonie, throw it in. It will help us offset just simple things like uh, lighting and heat and so on, and that would be appreciated. Peter uh, came all the way from Windsor, 
And really, the only thing that attracted him was that his family is here in eastern Ontario, and so tomorrow night they're going to have a great get-together, I'm yeah. sure. Yeah. And uh, uh, coming all the way to Backenham uh, for this presentation uh, is a long way to come at some considerable personal expense for him. And I, 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 f I have felt rather guilty all day trying to think of some way to, uh, to thank Peter adequately. And it, it finally hit me this afternoon. About three weeks ago, uh, the minister at this podium uh, spoke from a text in the Bible about uh, the woman who um, goes to the community well, and Jesus meets her there, and he said, you know, what are you doing here? And she said, well, there's a wedding celebration going on back at home, and the wine's all gone. They've drunk it all, and I'm here to get water. And Jesus turned the... Uh, turned the water into wine. Well, earlier today, I went up to Peter's house and I delivered a bottle of water <laughs> so that tomorrow night they can have water. But I did so in the understanding, because I know David and now I know Peter quite well. These talented gentlemen, I'm quite sure, can turn water into wine. <laughs> It's do, already turned. Do, uh, <laughs> do enjoy Peter's company as long as he agrees to stay. Thank you all for coming. Thanks very much. Thank you. Oh, yes. Yeah, this is a... Uh, it's a little bit like a ship, you know? It's sort of like the poop deck. You know? <laughs>